Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Zatarans, a New Orleans tradition since 1889, and by French Market Coffee, locally roasted in New Orleans for 125 years. From WWNO New Orleans and our studios in the Southern Food and Beverage Museum, this is Louisiana Eats. I'm Poppy Tooker. It's so hot in Louisiana right now, I think you could fry the proverbial egg on the sidewalk. On this week's Louisiana Eats, we take a break from the summertime heat and travel to the land of the midnight sun for a look at the culture and food traditions across the Nordic region. Extreme ingenuity has always been required for man to survive there. If it's edible, they'll eat it. At his famed restaurant, Favikan, Swedish chef Magnus Nielsen showcases the region's diversity using locally foraged and preserved foods totally foreign to our palates. After our adventure with Magnus, we continue our Nordic food investigation with the great culinary academic Dara Goldstein, whose most recent book, Fire and Ice, examines this region of extremes. Finally, we'll get a local view of life in Scandinavia from Louisiana-born Michael Bissetta, who's working in a trendy downtown bar in Copenhagen while pursuing a PhD in political science at the university there. Grab a blanket and a bottle of Aquavit. We're traveling to the land of fire and ice on this week's Louisiana Eats. So my name is Magnus Nilsson, and I'm the chef at the restaurant called Favik in Magasinet up north in Sweden. Magnus Nilsson's Flavikan is nestled in a small farm area in the middle of Sweden, near the Norwegian border. Flavikan's allure comes from the creative use of traditional, locally foraged and preserved foods, presented as edible art. Magnus himself is Swedish, but he's taken on the whole of Scandinavia and beyond in his newly released Nordic cookbook. This isn't just any cookbook. The enormous tome illustrates, through stunning photos and hundreds of recipes, the way Nordic food traditions emerge from the cold, harsh climate that characterizes the region in winter and celebrates the long days of summer. When I had the opportunity to visit with Magnus, I was curious to learn how much of today's Nordic food still springs from the element of mere survival. Well, it used to, and, and it's something that still is very visible, because like anywhere in the Nordic region, you're going to have four very distinctive seasons, and one of them, the winter, you're not going to be able to harvest any plant materials for food. Um, and because of this, you have to kind of uh, produce an excess in summer and store it for winter. And this is something that even today, when you can you know, fly things in from everywhere, and uh, when it's not really done for survival anymore, it still um, characterizes the food culture to a, a really large extent. Tell us some of the things that might surprise people about the preservation methods, like um, lamb being cured with no salt, only air dried. Yeah. So like that particular technique, for example, that you talk about now, it's actually not from where I grew up. It's from the Faroe Islands, um, which is a, a group of islands uh, located in the North Atlantic in between Scotland and Iceland. Um, and because they were so remotely located uh, before modern shipping and flying and all that stuff, um, most of their traditional preservation techniques are saltless because they couldn't transport salt there from mainland Europe very cheaply. Like most people, I didn't know that much about Faroe Islands, uh, except that it existed, basically. <laughs> but I started writing on um, uh, a new book three years ago, uh, The Nordic Cookbook. And that book took three years. Yes, it did. Well, and, that's and understandable. <laughs> How many pages are in that book? I don't know, 700, I don't know, yes. 50 or something like that. Oh, um, but I kind of thought I knew quite a lot about Nordic food country before I started. And I realized sort of <laughs> a bit into the process that I knew almost nothing. <laughs> so I understand that um, the publisher approaches you and wants you to write this book and that you didn't really want to write this book. No, I didn't because I was, I, and I was kind of offended because most people in the Nordic region, they don't identify themselves as being Nordic. 
nor do I, because I'm Swedish. And I felt it was a bit like taking some German and some Italian and some Portuguese and some French cooking as putting that into a book and calling it sort of the European cookbook. Um, but then I realized after kind of going back and forth a little bit that it was one of the main reasons why the book should actually exist because almost no one knows what the Nordic region is. And if you don't even know that, you can't really know much about this food culture either. Walk us through the great diversity that you found in your research and that we can find between the pages of the Nordic cookbook. Well, you know, uh, the region itself is vast um, and has a lot of different climates in it. And because of the, you know, its geographical size, you're also going to have a lot of different cultures kind of sharing this region. And it's not a, um, the Nordic regions as such, it's not a cultural region. It's just a geographical construction. Um, so you have countries in it that up until quite recently in historical terms had very, very little contact with each other. You have Finland in the very east, and then in between Finland and Sweden, you're going to have a little island called Åland. You're going to have Sweden, Norway, Denmark, the Faroe Islands, Iceland, and Greenland. Uh, and you can just imagine the difference, you know, from, let's say, uh, southeastern parts of Finland, which borders on Russia, and then Greenland in the west. Yes, it's huge. Pre- yeah, it is, and very different culturally as well. Now, in the book, I'd like to know how you picked the recipes, because I have to say... I've never come across a cookbook that included recipes for seal, (laughs) whale, and puffin. (laughs) Yeah. Well, the thing is that, like, to me, it was really important that this sort of became a document of, like, the real Nordic food culture as it looks today. Recipes like that, even though, to me, they're also very exotic because we don't eat any of those animals in Sweden, for example. Um, But because they exist in other parts of the region and they're culturally significant in those parts, they kind of have to be included in the book. Um, And I don't think that anyone is going to cook those recipes. But it doesn't really matter, you know, Um, because the the book has so many recipes. There are 730-something of them. And I actually counted, and I think that about 50 no one is ever going to cook for either that reason, you know, that you don't have the produce or because they are very, very complicated. Um, and the important thing is that the remaining 600 and something recipes, they are commonly used on a much broader front by more people in the region and they're more accessible. Um, the one thing that's clear is that there's not a single recipe in the book that's mine that I kind of made. Uh, they're all collected from other people in the region and people who cook them on an everyday basis. One of the first things I did was to put up a website uh, where people could submit recipes and answer to questions about how they looked up on their own food culture. Uh, And that was very, very interesting because I got like at least 100 recipes for pickled herring uh, submitted by a person who said that they were the best recipes for pickled herring ever. ever. Uh, And it turned out that most of them were actually pretty much similar. <laughs> but they were they were all someone's best recipe ever. So that was kind of fun. Um, and I also saw that the way people see their own food culture, how they perceive it is uh, quite different from how it actually is, you know, in the real world. And the next step after that was just to start traveling, basically, uh, going around all of the Nordic countries and visiting people, interviewing them. I understand that a big part of the culture is flatbread. Mm. Does flatbread vary from place to place, or is it all pretty much alike? Uh, the, all breads vary quite a lot from place to place, like any other kind of food cultural expression. And what's interesting with the flatbread is that it's a true expression of you know, the circumstances historically in the regions where they are produced. And in the Nordics, you can see, for example, that in the south, in the more urban areas, like from Stockholm and down south, you know, across Denmark and so on, uh, it's more common with loaves of bread because they have dense enough population also in a historical perspective to have bakeries. Mm -hmm. Uh, Further up north, like where I grew up, uh, we have today a population density of one person per square kilometer. (laughs) That's kind of good. (laughs) It is, Um, meaning that you can't really have bakeries meaning that you have to produce bread that you can store for a long time because no one is going to fire up their baking oven on a daily basis just to bake bread for themselves. And this is kind of the idea with the flatbread. And most often they're actually dried. And when they're dried, how long will they last like that? Uh, Years. And after being baked in the wood-fired oven, you just stack them to dry and you leave them like that. And you can either just break pieces off and make a sandwich with it or you can just sort of crumble it into a soup or into cultured milk or something like that. I was very charmed by the concept that in 
these ovens where there's this hot, hot, flat stone mm. where the flatbreads are being baked. Once a farm family will finish, yeah. they will invite their neighbors to come yeah. over and <laughs> use their precious heat. Yeah. Tell me about that community experience. Now, that was how it, like, how it actually really functioned in the villages, uh, especially in Sweden in the old days, because all of the farms, they were located around the kind of core of the village. Um, so everyone was pretty close together. So it was quite convenient if someone fired up their baking oven that instead of just sort of wasting the heat when you were done, you know, your neighbors and your neighbors' neighbors could come over and continue baking on the heat or adding a little bit of extra firewood and kind of just starting it all over again. Uh, and that has kind of disappeared a little bit. It still exists in some villages, uh, villages like mine, where the farms are still located in roughly that pattern. Take us to your little village. Let's let's like circle in on where you live today, and talk about your restaurant, Flavican. So much of what you serve at Flavican is a total hunter gatherer forger experience from what's around you. Am I correct? Quite. Like, there is definitely an element of that, but it's also you know it reflects all the other sort of characteristics of the region as well. You know, with the farm culture and uh, stuff like that too. So it's not it's not just wild foods. Was it always as intimate and small as it is? Because if I understand correctly, you only sixteen lucky people get In to eat room, with yeah. you daily. No, it, it, it was actually even smaller from the beginning. It was just eight from the beginning, and it was a communal table at the. Um, oh, so you've had grand floor. expansion. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> we have. Well, take us on a. Uh, an unusual dining experience at Flavican. First of all, how long does it really take to get a reservation there? So we release our reservations on the 1st of April, which is kind of a funny date to do that, but <laughs> that's the one we're choosing. Um, and uh, it books out pretty quickly. For the whole year? Yeah. And is it a... Uh, specific menu when you come to Flavican? Do you eat what is served? Are there choices? Uh, there are no choices. It's a set menu and uh, it's a tasting menu with many little bites, you know, to showcase as much of the food culture of the area as possible. Uh, how, how many is the usual number? Uh, it's usually between 25 and 30 little things. Oh, so the things that I saw that you've done that just blew me away, that process that you go through with colostrum. And for anybody who wouldn't know <laughs> what that is, explain what that is, when so, you get it, and then what you do with it. <laughs> so colostrum is the first milk that any mammal gives after having given birth. Um, and it's a very common traditional uh, food, especially then harvested from cows in like most European countries, actually. Um, that tradition has died out uh, further south, but it's still you know, very common uh, up north in Scandinavia. Um, and what you do is that the, the calf gets the first couple of milkings because they need that to uh, you know, basically kickstart their immune system and stuff like that. Yes. Um, and then the uh, third and fourth milking you harvest. And um, the colostrum is very different from normal milk because it has an extremely high protein content. So if you, for example, would take colostrum and pour it in a pan and, you know, put it on heat, it would s uh, stiffen like if it was eggs. Um, and it's also very rich in flavor and it's um, uh, it's it's extremely tasty, actually. Is um, it like the cream of the cream of the cream? What? But it's, what, it's not as fat taste? as cream. It's not as fatty as cream. It's very, it's very rich from all those proteins and flavor. Uh, and traditionally, you make something called calv dance, which is literally translates to cough's dance. Um, and it's basically colostrum with a little bit of normal milk added to it and sugar. And you bake it like a custard in the oven um, to eat it with whipped cream or berries and something like that. And is that something you had growing up? Yes, definitely. Now, just describe that magic trick that you, I've seen you do with colostrum because it, it's just so artful to take something so traditional <laughs> and then transform yeah. it. Yeah, so what we did was to create, um, uh, it looks almost like a little eggshell out of milk powder. Uh, and then we make basically like the traditional dessert, but we just mix it until it's a smooth kind of creamy custard and we pipe that into the little shell. Uh, and then we add some um, berries and stuff into the shell again. And, you know, you just pick the whole thing up and you eat it in one bite. Oh, it must be the most magical bite it's anybody ever puts <laughs> in their mouth. Well, I'm so honored. And 
I really hope that sometime in this great big world, our paths cross again. So thank you so much for making the time for us. Thanks for having me. (laughs) And please do come and visit sometime. (laughs) I'd love to. Magnus Nielsen, chef at Flavikon in Sweden and author of the Nordic Cookbook. come back from a short break, our trip through Scandinavia continues with culinary academic Dara Goldstein. I'm Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Rouse's Markets and from Cafe B, featuring contemporary Creole cuisine with an emphasis on fresh Gulf seafood served in a charming yet unpretentious old Metairie setting. Lunch, dinner, Sunday brunch, and private events on Metairie Road. Cookbook author Dara Goldstein, the icy climes of the Nordic region represent warmth and comfort. Although she grew up an ocean away from Scandinavia, Dara's close ties to Nordic culture inspired her to write about the diverse food of the region in her latest book, Fire and Ice, Classic Nordic Cooking. We caught up with Dara to talk about the food traditions of what she calls a region of extremes, a place of perpetual winter nights and endless summer days. It's an extraordinary place. I often question why I am drawn to cold and dark places, and I think part of it is because of the intensity. It Even in the winter when there's snow, it's actually quite bright because There's a radiance from the snow and from the ice, and there's a sort of magic to the winter season that uh, I find very compelling. Dara, I'm fascinated by the name of your book as well. Why is it called Fire and Ice? I thought about the extremes that we've just been talking about And what really characterizes being in the far north? So you have the cold season and there's ice. And what do you do? You want to get warm, whether it's through the heat of a fire or through warming drinks like glug, which is mulled wine and has this wonderful onomatopoetic name as though you're gulping down this wine. So I think that the fire is the lure when the weather is so cold, but it also is the lure in the summertime when you grill. And one of the great characteristics of food from the Nordic region is that preserving it has been so important just for survival. I know it's all very trendy now, (laughs) but historically it was what had to be done so you could get through the winter. And smoking is one of those ways of preserving. How long has the food of Scandinavia captivated you? For a very long time. I first went there in 1972 to study at University of Helsinki. I felt a rhythm of the seasons that I had never experienced. And then in 1980, just after I'd gotten married, my husband and I lived in Stockholm for a year. So that was my second deep immersion in the Nordic countries. This is a huge region. Would you talk a little bit to the similarities and the distinct regional differences between Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark? Yes. Scandinavians are strictly defined as uh, Norwegians, Danes, and Swedes. And they don't usually include Finland in the fold which is why this is Nordic and not, uh, strictly speaking, Scandinavian. All of these countries have very long coastlines, 
And so they all share an appreciation for fish. There are lots of lakes, particularly in Finland, and so freshwater fish is also a very important source of protein. What you find as you travel from east to west, Finland uh, was an outlier in the sense of not being as uh, closely tied to Western Europe as the other countries, and it also uh, was part of the Russian Empire for quite a while. And so there are influences that you can see from that part of the world and certain similarities. As you travel towards Denmark, um, going west and also south, there's a stronger influence from, uh, say, French cuisine. But the thing that is very neat about the new Nordic movement is that now even the classically trained chefs are looking to their own traditions and their own culture to see the treasures that are actually there. I would love if you would address crayfish versus crawfish, because just as in Louisiana, we've got a huge culture, ritual, way of eating and partying with crawfish. They have that in the Nordic countries as well, don't they? They do. And it used to be so institutionalized in particularly Sweden and Finland It used to be a very specific day at the end of July or the beginning of August when the crayfish season opened. Now it's a lot more flexible, but that is the season. It is high summer. Uh, People sit outside and boil these huge vats of the crayfish with lots and lots of dill. So the flavor profile is different from the way you uh, do the crawfish in Louisiana. There is native crayfish that uh, lives in the rivers in Sweden and Finland. But unfortunately, in the very beginning of the 20th century, it fell prey to a, a kind of fungus, and the numbers were vastly depleted. And so it, it became expensive not just because of that, but because people were overfishing, as people throughout the world tend to do whenever they find anything they love. And so quotas were put on the number of uh, the crayfish that could be caught. There's still a lot of crayfish imported, but uh, the Swedes and the Finns tend to like the indigenous one best and will pay a pretty penny for it. Well, it sounds like dill is the big difference between a crawfish and a crayfish party in uh, Louisiana or in Scandinavia. Right. Yeah, you put um, the whole heads, the crowns of the dill in when you boil the crayfish and then you let it sit. And obviously there's a lot of salt and you can uh, put in some other spices if you like, but you let it sit for hours so that it steeps and the crayfish gets infused with this wonderful dill flavor. Now, another thing I want to hear about are the artisanal tar products that come from oh. Finland. That doesn't sound too tasty to me. I know. But if you think about it, if you have a cold, you might suck a eucalyptus drop. Uh, You may or may not like it, but a lot of people like a menthol flavor. So if you think about tar, not as the uh, stuff that is used to pave the roads, which does sound totally disgusting, But if you think about it as the sap, the resin that comes from trees that then can be boiled down, then it sounds intriguing. Mm -hmm. Did I convince you? You'd convinced me. Give me an example of what an artisanal tar product might be that we would eat. I have to admit that the only one that I really like is tar ice cream. Tar ice um, cream? What color yeah. is it? Yeah. Have you ever had tobacco ice cream? No, ma'am. Oh, <laughs> you got me there, really too. It's really wonderful. I don't think it's um, commercially marketed, but um, it's ice cream that just has this hint of tar flavor to it, and it's fantastic. They also make a tar liqueur, which I find too intense and too cloying. There are tar chocolates, and probably the most famous 
product that's still being made in one town in Finland is a tar bread. It is a very, very dark uh, bread that has some tar syrup added to it. But that's what I love about Finland. I feel like you can go there and really test your palate to the extreme, but in a way that, to me, connects with things that are natural so that it's not just food adventuring. It really, there's a reason for it. They had a big tar industry there. So if you have this product, then you also think of other ways to use it. Well, I I would really like to end the conversation by just giving you, as best I can virtually, a hug. Because, Dara, even hugs come from there. Oh, Poppy, you really read this book closely. So that's a perfect way to end, I think, with this idea of Danish hygge. It is a concept that doesn't have an exact translation in English, but it basically means being in a cold, wintry environment when it's not so nice outdoors, kind of gloomy outside, but you have created this beautiful warmth inside through a fire or candlelight, through glug, which is this mulled wine, or perhaps even better, schnapps, uh, which is Uh, aquavit, distilled uh, vodka-like liquor that is often flavored with caraway, uh, or you can, I like to add cardamom and ginger to it for a really nice warming drink. But the most important component of that besides the food is the companionship. So it's camaraderie, it's spending the time with friends, and it's an idea of coziness, sort of ultimate coziness with people you like being with, with food that is warming. And it comes from the old Norse root that produced our word hug. So hugs to you too. Big hugs from Louisiana Eats. Dara, thank you for taking us on this fun, vicarious trip to Scandinavia and the Nordic countries. Thank you. Poppy, thank you so much. It's always a joy to talk to you. Dara Goldstein, author of Fire and Ice, Classic Nordic Cooking. After speaking with Dara Goldstein about the Nordic way of boiling crawfish, I simply have to give it a stab. In her book, Fire and Ice, Dara substitutes shrimp for crawfish in her recipe, which only serves four and only uses three pounds of shrimp. That's not going to do at any Louisiana shrimp or crawfish boil. But if all this Nordic food talk has you in the mood for experimentation, here's my stab at how to do it. First, The boiling liquid is a combination of two parts water to one part dark ale. With our craft beer movement booming from north to south here in Louisiana, the choices of dark ale are endless, so that's no problem. For the seasoning, you're going to make a mix using two parts salt to one part sugar and dill seed. Bring the whole thing to a boil and add those squirming mud bugs. When the pot returns to a boil, throw in several bunches of fresh dill weed and turn the fire off. They cover the pot and let them sit in the brine at room temperature for six to eight hours before draining the crawfish and serving them. Hmm, I like my crawfish hot, so that alone is going to require some serious adaptation and Besides, I don't know for sure if anybody can wait that long for the crawfish party to begin. But that's how they do it in Scandinavia. And also, unless you've got a huge herb garden, those bunches of dillweed could really run up the cost of the boil. So here's what I suggest. 
To get that Scandinavian taste, use two or three cups of dill seed. And just as we often sprinkle extra crab oil on our crawfish, chop up some fresh dill and sprinkle it on top of the crawfish after you pour them out on the table. If you give this a try, please, let's compare notes. In the meantime, you can find Dara's original recipe on our Louisiana Eats website at itsneworleans.com and wwno.org. I'm Poppy Tooker, and no matter which way you boil them, crawfish are some good Louisiana Eats. Ask anyone in the U.S. to name a liquor from Scandinavia, and chances are they'd say Absolute Vodka. But behind Absolute's sleek bottles and glamorous ad campaign is a carefully handcrafted vodka distilled in southern Sweden using a secret 100-year-old recipe. We sat down with Miranda Dixon and Jonas Tallinn, who told us all about their Swedish distillation tradition. I asked Miranda and Jonas to demystify vodka and the absolute legacy. I think that working in the world of vodka is a very interesting spirit to work in. It's very different uh, in terms of the way it's made from any other spirit. Um, Unlike many spirits, it doesn't have a really distinctive taste and flavor. Uh, Nothing is added to vodka during production methods. It's not aged typically in barrels. There are some small brands from Eastern Europe that do that. But predominantly the taste and flavor of vodka comes from the materials uh, employed to make the juice. And we're talking about the grain that's used to make the product, uh, the water source, and then the production methods are the sort of holy trinity, I suppose, of the way that uh, influences the taste and flavor of uh, the final product. Vodka has the ability of becoming a symbol of culture, which sounds a bit lofty, but it's actually true because it's such a ubiquitous product that, you know, almost everybody loves and they put it on the table. And what they put on the table, I think, often says something about the times that we're in. So when Absolute Vodka was launched in the early 80s or 1979, but it was growing in the early 80s, it became a little bit of a symbol of the revolt against the 70s. It became a symbol of pop culture, Andy Warhol, pop art, Studio 54, and it really became a symbol of that era. Then, you know, in in fairness to our competitors, I think some of them with with these tall, frosted, super premium products became, you know, very symbolic of the era of wealth that came in the 90s all the way up until 2009 where we had the culture of, look, I've got money and I can show it and this is my badge to prove that I have this this wealth. And then I think after 2009, something happened again, which is that the world has sort of returned to some of these more fundamental values of appreciating, understanding the story behind and the handcraft and the substance that goes into making something. So I think if you're asking me what's the marketing strategy of Absolute Elix is I would love for this brand to become a symbol of culture, which is this culture of, of genuine handcraft and substance rather than a badge that you're putting on your table because you're wanting to impress someone. I'm very curious about um, Absolute and its roots in Sweden. Um, How how old is Absolute? How long has Absolute been made? Well, we launched uh, Absolute Vodka in 1979. So it was originally a brand that was owned by the Swedish government uh, because there was a monopoly at the time uh, on vodka within Sweden. And in 2008, Absolute became part of the Pernod Ricard portfolio. But we've always produced the vodka exactly the same. All the wheat still comes from one single region within uh, Sweden. So every drop of Absolute everywhere in the United States comes from this small region in Sweden called Skorna. And in Sweden, what does Absolute Vodka mean to the Swedish people? I think Absolute Vodka is really a symbol of national pride. Sweden is a small country of 9 million people, yet we've created this amazing brand which you know goes above and beyond being a vodka. Uh, the brand comes from you know back in the 19th century uh, where a man called L.O. Smith created a vodka which he called absolutely pure vodka. 
And that production method that he patented and popularized in Sweden and then Europe and the world was this continuous distillation, which made it absolutely pure. And that is the origin of the word absolute, and that's also the meaning of absolute vodka. So that recipe, which he created in the 19th century, is essentially what we rekindled when the brand was launched in 1979, but then shortened from absolute pure vodka into absolute vodka. What I think very few people know is the way in which we go about making it, because so many people know absolute vodka more for its fantastic marketing and that unique bottle shape, which is so iconic. I think very few people realize how it's actually made. The fact that it's all being made in this small little village in southern Sweden, where you have all of these local farmers who all bring the wheat directly to the plant, where we're using our own deep water well with water that hasn't been touched by civilization. So it really is a very carefully made vodka, something that we've never really talked about because we we used more the bottle as a canvas for art, a canvas for escapism and exotic images. That's where we decided to focus, and we never talked so much about how we made it. But it was, since 1979 until today, a very, very careful way of of making the vodka, and it is the largest locally produced vodka in the world. What we try to do at Absolute is always be ahead and second-guess people in terms of doing something magical and different and escape, uh, encourage escapism, really. Well, thank you for all the magic that (laughs) you have brought to me, and thanks for coming to talk with us on Louisiana Eats. Thank you. Thank you. Miranda Dixon and Jonas Tallinn of Absolute Vodka. What's the traditional drink of Scandinavia? Stay tuned, and we'll answer that question when we come right back. I'm Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen, Zatarain's, and by French Market Coffee. Every premium blend of French Market Coffee contains a richness that can only be called New Orleans Bold. Made from the finest beans, slow roasted in small batches, only one coffee captures the bold flavor of our one-of-a-kind city. French Market Coffee. New Orleans Bold. If you want to be my friend, you want us to get along, please do not expect me to wrap it up and keep it there. Here's this week's culinary quiz question. Brought to you with support from Popeye's Louisiana Culinary Institute. What's the traditional drink of Scandinavia? The answer is aquavit, something you've probably never tasted unless you visited there. Aquavit comes from the Latin aquavite, which translates water of life. It's a high-proof clear liquor, much like vodka, that's distilled from either potatoes or grain. Aquavit is flavored with caraway, cardamom, cumin, anise, fennel, and dill, with caraway being the most outstanding taste. Some drink it cold, some at room temperature, some drink it out of shot glasses, and some out of little stem tulip glasses. But everyone in Scandinavia drinks Aquavit, especially at weddings and other celebrations. Oh, and of course, at crawfish boils. Yes, in Finland and Sweden, during late July and early August, it's the preferred drink with boiled crawfish, along with plenty of beer and schnapps. The traditional toast is skal. So, skal, y'all! I'm Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats. Okay, before we get into our next interview, here's the full disclosure. I've known Michael Bassetta since the day he was born. 
He's the son of a dear childhood friend, and it's been my distinct pleasure to watch him grow from a baby into a man. Although Louisiana-born, Michael has a great hunger for adventure and is currently living in Copenhagen, working in a trendy downtown bar while pursuing a Ph.D. in political science at the university there. Like any good New Orleans boy, Michael recently brought his friends home for a visit. When his mother, Bridget, told me that Michael was coming home with a pack of Great Danes, I couldn't resist having them all into the studio to hear about bar life in Copenhagen. And yes, there was some brown American liquor involved in the interview. I can't even begin to pronounce their names, so I'll let them introduce themselves. Let's start with the boss. <laughs> My name is Morton. I'm 34 years old. I'm from Copenhagen, Denmark. And uh, I, I do bars in Copenhagen, bars and restaurants, for about eight, eight or nine years now. I'm Rene. I'm uh, 24 years old. Uh, I come from Copenhagen, and I'm bartending at Velkul. Yeah, I'm uh, Christian, uh, 25, also from uh, from Copenhagen. I I study next to uh, to the job as a bartender, and it started sort of like just to have something to do on the weekends, and then sort of grew a natural interest for it over the uh, over the years. Before I ended up at the same bar as these guys. Yeah, I'm Remy. I'm from Lithuania, but I've been living in Denmark for the past five years. I came there to study. Uh, I finished it, and I started working in Red uh almost one year ago. I also have a side job in Abercrombie and Fitch. I'm uh, Michael from uh, from New Orleans, and um, I've been bartending for about two years, two and a half years. And um, other than that, I'm doing my PhD in political science at the University of Copenhagen. Well, as the senior member here, as the boss, you're the you're boss. the boss, traveling with the boys here. How did you get into this business eight years ago? I was mainly a fluke, actually. Uh, I was I'm, I'm originally I'm in uh, with an air traffic controlling in Denmark. And then I just decided to do something else, uh, and I started doing service industry as well. And we were doing a school project when I was studying that within tourism. And then you know, school project was actually the first project was trying to get a New Orleans boat back to Copenhagen and make like a casino and all that. That was a little bit too costly, so I, I made a small bar instead, and then it just went from there. And what's the name of the bar? Uh, well, it's a, it's an old Danish name. It's called Veltkulen, W E L T K U G L E N. It's an old uh, German Danish name back from dating back from 1767. So, I mean, it's a, it's an old historic listed building, and it's it's like old timbered house, and, and tell people that it's still probably the oldest cocktail bar in Copenhagen, which is not completely true, but I guess mixing two, two you know Making spirits. Up yeah, yeah, exactly. What's your clientele like? Uh, oh. Pretty much everybody. Yeah. It depends on what what time of the night it is. I mean, early early it's tourists and you know just general people walking by and, and coming in for a cocktail. And then uh, you know passing midnight, one two o'clock, then the then the right bars. because we're in we're in the sort of right in the downtown, downtown part of Copenhagen where all the restaurants are, all the bars are, and so we're open till five. So when the service industry people get off work, they get sort of like a chart room type yeah. of thing. So they they come to us and it's this restaurant, that restaurant. They want good drinks. And, and and it does make for some interesting evenings because we start out with a nice and quiet crowd. We can we can do table waiting and and really get into all the. I mean, you pick up on a lot of stuff that you want to sort of tell people, even though they sometimes don't want to hear it. But like cocktail history, and and then it, there's a switch right around midnight, one o'clock, where the service industry people come in and the music goes up, and we we do the same cocktails, but it's a whole different type of bar then. A bit more party. Really late oh, yeah. to get to no light. <laughs> yeah, you get to dance on the table and really and have the spray fire. Yeah. Now and We're then. making ten whiskey oh, yeah. sours at a time instead yeah. of two. You know. Yeah. yeah. Ten whiskey sours at a time. Okay. Well, what? So, what time does the bar open? What are the opening hours? Well, four usually, at least in the weekends and uh, or eight o'clock in in the weekdays. So pretty much, you're going like. 4 p.m. till 5 a.m. Yeah. Huh? Six or seven, depending on the. You crowd. work in yeah. one shift. Who's how many shifts are there? Well, one guy opens at 3:30, and then the other two. One comes in at eight, and then one comes in at 10 o'clock, and then we all roll till till five, five six in, in the morning. morning. Unless it's a bit quiet, then the first guy gets to go home early, which yeah. sometimes is 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 quite nice. <laughs> well, well, Michael, a New Orleans boy, and working in a bar that stays open till 5 a.m. You must be um, right in your element. Yeah, I'm loving it. And and the best part about Copenhagen is that, you know, when we get off work, we still want to go have a beer. And there are some places that people are partying till. And there's still one bar that's open 24-7, but you never go there. <laughs> oh, well, welcome to New Orleans, boys, because nothing ever closes here. Oh, damn. Well, Michael, you, you know, you're an American. You, you're a New Orleanian. 
in your opinion, what would your average American find the most shocking? At bars in Denmark, the blondes. Oh, <laughs> I, I knew that was going. Fine bar. Oh, that's just you speaking from personal experience yes, here. Yes. When you go into pretty much any bar in Copenhagen, just the, yeah, both guys and girls, just it's, people are good looking, um, and that sort of, and they like to party, they love to drink, and and usually they can control it. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> yeah, big drinkers in, the, in Denmark. Big drinkers, and they like to buy into that reputation they have. So. So how is it for all of you European gentlemen to have like the the big American suddenly show up at the bar? <laughs> well, what what is Michael thrown into the mix as a New Orleanian who knows a thing or two about cocktails? Party, yeah, <laughs> bourbon <laughs> style music, man. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and the, I mean the guests do love that there's a guy not from Denmark behind the bar because then they won't have to hear the same old stories over and over again. Yeah. The country music has really picked up since Michael started working there. <laughs> <laughs> and they and they love the Sazeracs. They know they're from New Orleans, so I give yeah. them the whole uh, the whole story down at the with the Peychaud's bitters and everything. Love it. Do you throw, throw that one, glass up in the air? I throw the glass and say Sazerac. Hey, oh, you hit that one time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that epic rinse is, is something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Christian still needs to learn how to do it, so there's no <laughs> apps in all over. To pull. Yeah, because then we have to clean the whole bar afterwards. Tell me about uh, the taste profile of your customers there, and what do they like? You know, I, you're... You're mentioning drinks like whiskey sours. Somebody just came home from a big trip to Spain, and it flipped her out that everywhere they went, there were walls of gin, and everybody was drinking gin and tonic. Mm, so it's, what's up with that? It's kind of mixed, because now and then, the, the normal Danish Palais is really, really sugary. And now and then, you can have people coming in for straight-up drinks, like those stiff drinks, like old-fashioned Sazerac's, whatever. But in, in the hot summer days, it's pretty much only gin tonics. Yeah. But also still, you can go for the more fresher cocktails, like Southside. And people like to experience new stuff down there. Yeah, and so I think the most popular drinks we do are probably Whiskey Sours, yeah. Dark and Stormies. Okay. Our own Suffering okay. Bastard got really popular with the summer. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's pretty cool, I think, personally, how, how we do our... our menus. Menu, yeah. Because we, ha we have a menu that's basically our own cocktails and about, what, about four times a year. We get together and um, yeah, we just make we variations on classics, menu. and we all get together, just us, and we taste which ones we like, and we modify them, and then we put them on the menus with the uh, interesting names. So, for an American, what would be the most um, unusual or sort of shocking cocktail that you all make? I mean, Denmark pretty much we don't copy it, but we look to America when 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 we look at the cocktails. I mean, right now the whole scene in Denmark is is uh, turn around the classic cocktail scene after all the Mad Men and all that, uh, all these TV shows. So, I mean, it's hard to say which one exactly would be uh, would well, be very... Yeah, I will say, I mean, we we do use a lot of bitters. So, Fennet Branca, uh, I think Denmark is, what, the second leading Yeah, we drink consumer. a lot of Fennet Branca. Yeah, next to Argentina. Right. And then we have this stuff <laughs> called Gamel Dents, which means Old Danish. And this is sort of like a... That's a bit Like a really Jägermeister horrible. that you drink when you're fishing or hunting, and that's sort of our house shot that... Uh, I don't think that's something you can get in the United States, huh? No. No, we were supposed to bring bottles, but it was the two guys working that shift that were supposed to bring them, and when they were at the airport, they forgot everything about it. So, <laughs> sad we don't have anything with us. Yeah. We'll ship one down to you. New Orleans born Michael Bissetta and his pack of Great Danes. That's it for this week's edition of Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Subscribe to our podcast, hear today's show, or catch up on previous editions anytime online at itsneworleans.com. Louisiana Eats is made possible with major support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen, Zatarans, French Market Coffee, and Rouse's Market. Additional support for Louisiana Eats is provided by the Shreveport Bossier Convention and Tourist Bureau, by Dickie Brennan's Bourbon House, from oysters to redfish, serving fresh Gulf seafood on Bourbon Street, also home to the city's largest American whiskey and bourbon collection, and by Tujac's Restaurant, 
home of America's oldest stand-up bar, now celebrating 160 years on Decatur Street. Original theme music by Johnny Sketch and the Dirty Notes. Big thanks to producers Joe Schreiner, Sarah Holtz, and Reggie Morris. Come visit us anytime in our Louisiana Eat studios at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum. I'm Poppy Tooker. Louisiana Eats is a production of WWNO and the University of New Orleans.